This edition of I Italy New York is brought to you by L'energia non si ferma mai L'energia crea si trasforma diventa un'idea per generare nuova energia Diamo all'energia un'energia nuova and Cirio chopped tomatoes. In this week's episode, Americans in Love with Italy, Francine Sagan meets Joseph Forte. Dolce Vita, Sandwich Addiction at La Paninaria. Genius, Fred Gardafei reviews Eat Now, Talk Later by James Viscavi. The Italian City, Italy, New York unveils Cathedral of Milan. And now let's start with Joseph Forte. Joseph Forte received his doctorate from Columbia University. Dr. Forte has taught art history at Sarah Lawrence College since 1978 and is now chair of that department. He's written articles and exhibition catalogs on the art and architecture of the Italian Renaissance and also on modern architectural theory and practice. Joe traces his roots back to Sicily his grandparents having arrived in the U.S. in the late 19th century. And he often jokes to friends that he's from the furthest province of Italy, Brooklyn, New York. I'm thrilled that Joe is here today to chat with us about his love of Italy and Italian art and architecture. Thank you so much for being here, Joe, to talk about it's my Italy. Pleasure. Such my a pleasure. delight. So you have a special connection. What resonates about Italy for you? Well, uh, it was w when I was brought up in Brooklyn, right, in a Sicilian family, a Sicilian American family. Uh, I understood that there were certain things different about my experience than the other people who I lived around. Like, for instance, we never ate eggs for breakfast, or people talked at dinner loudly and things like that, which I found very reassuring. And then my grandfather, who uh, immigrated to the United States, at one point said, you know, this is kind of the way things are there. So when I was 16 years old, I went to Italy for the first time. My father's family was much more kind of artigianale. They used to do little shoemaking, things like that. But my mother's family, my grandfather, uh, Carmelo Fazio, was the first non-American-born electrician licensed in New York City. So he was always very committed to education, and that was always very much part of my mother's family. Anyway, I spoke, I, I, it was kind of like a Jewish kid going to Israel. And it was like everything made sense in a way the first time I went when I was a kid, although I didn't speak any Italian or anything at that time. And where did you go? Well, I went to the great tourist spots. I was a useless tourist, by the way, at that point. But I went to do all the great tourist spots, Rome, and uh, I went to Venice, and I went to Florence. And I spent uh, a good bit of time in Milano. But um, I just felt very comfortable, and I loved the, cu the culture. I loved the art. I loved all of those kinds of things. And then when I went back to college, I had gone to college early, and then I went, left for a while, and I went back. Um, I thought it was something that I wanted to study, and that's what I wound up studying. Although it's, I wound up studying two kind of different fields. But yes, that was one of them. Italian art and architecture was one of the things I was most interested in. And so now you're a professor at Sarah Lawrence. Yeah, and yeah somehow they kept me. <laughs> I didn't I give them any money. I read, I your student, any money to do I read your student reviews. Boy, oh boy. That's 20 bucks goes a long way when you're in college, let me tell you. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I bring the same passion to the classroom. Um, I love Italy. I love the language. Uh, I try to speak it as well as I possibly can. And um, I try to let my students see that it's a culture, no? You know, it's not just the work of art, but it's a whole 
way of thinking and you know the importance of the evolution of humanism and things of that sort are, are kind of ingrained in um, the northern Italian way of life. Southern Italian way of life is more complicated but the northern Italian way of life and I try to make that a very clear theme. Not the campanalismo thing like oh you know Florentines are great blah 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 but rather there's a culture here and this is a culture which is complex and trying to be modern too. And you're writing about and researching Bergamo right yes, now. Yes, I am. Uh, at the present moment, I am writing about Bergamo because I'm writing about the development of Renaissance Bergamo as uh, a kind of as a kind of line of demarcation between Milano and Venezia, between Milan and Venice, and uh, how the Venetians took Bergamo and tried to develop not only a kind of uh, military position there, but also an economic one. So they developed a whole, uh, you know, kind of section, you know, quartieri, nascimento, that was made up of palaces that were supposed to be by the merchants, and the merchants were like a bulwark against Milanese influence. So it's an interesting uh, study in um, in urban planning in the Renaissance. This what's called ad hoc planning, where they basically say, like, well, we better do something on the site quickly. In Florence, one of the unique aspects of Florentine urban development is the fact that the Florentines were able to exile their nobles. They actually, in the 13th century, passed a law which made it uh, impossible for the nobles to own land within the old Roman city. And the reason why they did that is because they were interested in keeping the nobles at bay. So in Rome or Florence? In Florence. So the, in yeah. Florence in they... In Florence they actually passed, under the Comune, under the Commune, they passed a law that within the old Roman city, right, which is the downtown, it goes from just the edge of the Duomo, Piazza del Duomo, all the way down to the river. They actually passed a law which made it impossible for nobles to buy downtown property. So the merchants kind of established that as their quarter, and it became a kind of center for the whole city's development at that point. For us, just normal people that are coming to visit Florence, what can you tell us about some of the buildings that you love? And what I like, first of all, the bridges. I like the bridges. Ponte Vecchio. Ponte Vecchio. All right. So tell me, do you know what the original function of Ponte Vecchio was? You, Butcher. you would know this. Yes, <laughs> butchers. Absolutely, it's butchers. So uh, typically you would think, right, that you would put butchers on a bridge because you wouldn't want the offal from all the you know, all the uh, cutting up of the animals to be brought into the city. So they would dump it into, the, you know, into the river, into the Arno. And it was really the Medici that changed that. And it was really a very significant change because when the Medici changed that, it set off a kind of whole fluorescence of the idea of locating all of the goldsmiths and all of the gold resources with, uh, in a city within a particular local, very local area. And so the creation of Ponte Vecchio as a place where gold would be kind of protected and that, that the gold skills would be powerful actually was picked up in Paris right afterward because the Medici prince, princesses went to Paris, right? I mean, they married. So the, the French Rafa. copied the Italians again. French copied again. the Italians again, one more time. <laughs> I'll look forward to seeing you next summer in, in Florence. I hope so. And thank you so much for oh, chatting with pleasure. us a little great. bit about Italy. Great to have Italy. everybody. You know, it's great to do. Thank Anything you, thank I can you. say that would help the cause. <laughs> Grazie mille. <laughs> Let's talk Italian food. Enjoy. My name is Mario Pisce and uh, I'm the owner of uh, La Panineria Made with Amore. I moved uh, from Italy uh, actually three years, and a, three years and a half ago with my brother Giuseppe. Uh, but in the beginning we were not supposed to open a business. We started to work as a bartender, server, you know, as every other Italian, mostly. I was at the Hudson River Park eating the Parma, the Robbiola cheese with prosciutto, and I was thinking by myself, uh, you know, why not to open a sandwich shop, but simple, you know, just with high quality ingredients. And uh, after a few months, we, we found the, the space and we decided to open this one. Every single thing that you see here, the shelf, the, the picture at the wall, it was in my mind since the beginning. 
all the renovation this place we made me my brother and my father with also my girlfriend and uh, you know it's like when you are in the in La Panineria it's it feels like and you are not in New York you you are back in Italy and this is the 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 thing that I wanted to to give to this place all the ingredients that you see as the meat, cheese, all the ingredients that we have uh, on, the, on the shelf, uh, we buy from Bonitalia uh, in the Chelsea market uh, because the owner is my uncle. So make, make uh, you know, the job a little bit easier. Everything is super high quality. I mean, we don't use cheap stuff. We use only the best of the best. We are new, so the people want to know what we do, what, what kind of food we make. But also they come because there is Mario, there is Peppe, there is Olga. They like to chat, they like the Italian accent. And uh, I have to tell them uh, they are open mind. I mean, they, they like to try new things and they like it. So we are trying also to teach. When we do sandwich, we don't do huge amount of meat and huge amount of meat. We, do the, we, we have a kind of balance. Um, but at the same time, I, I had to to introduce in the menu some uh, American uh, sandwich as the Super Mario, which is prosciutto parma, mortadella, salame and mozzarella. This is the classic American, but at the same time with Italian ingredients. We're gonna make a couple sandwich and then we're gonna go to the park to taste what the American know about Italian uh, meat and cheese. make a nice sandwich called it Alba. Take the bread and take it off the hard part and cut in the middle. Then we're gonna put a little bit of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil to be exact. Now we're gonna start with the fontina cheese. Sandwich in the oven to make um, the cheese uh, melt. Prosciutto parma 16 months. And then we're gonna put on the machine. We can take the sandwich. Extra virgin olive oil with black truffle. We have this special machine and make it like a spray. Here we go. Alba sandwich, it's ready. Guys, the second sandwich, it's called Cortina. And uh, basically it's speck with taleggio cheese, which is one of my favorites. This is the taleggio cheese, guys. Mm. Then we take the speck. Looks like prosciutto, but it's smoked because there are some herbs, some pepper, and they put in a special steam room. A little bit more of extra virgin olive oil. Cortina sandwich. Hello, miss. You wanna try? Maybe parmigiano, taleggio no. o fontina? Fontina. Yes. Do you want to taste some uh, Italian amazing food? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Uh, you have to guess. This is the game. I'm going to give you three options, okay? I might have to try it alone. Okay. Miss, what about you? Prosciutto, right? It's speck. Oh. It's a kind of prosciutto. It's smoked. <laughs> and the cheese is taleggio. Creamy, nice. I like this one better. Good. Thank you. Right. So we are doing a kind of game. So basically, you try one of these. Well, olive oil would be the guess. Truffle. Olive oil. Oh, oh, oh. If you don't like, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's good? Okay. Wow. It's prosciutto, yes. And then there is fontina cheese and then a black truffle olive oil. Yeah. Sounds nice, eh? You're a friend. <laughs> no, yes. Yes. 
It's 8th Street, at, uh, it's at the corner of 5th Avenue. It's right, right there. You can try one. You can have one. Grazie. Prego. I think it was a great success. They enjoyed it, and probably they're going to come to La Paninería to enjoy all the other sandwiches that we have. So, guys, mission complete. We reviewed this book. Eat now, talk later. That's what James Vescovi's uh, grandmother used to tell him uh, when he was sitting down at the table. And at that table, James listened to a lot of stories. His collection, Eat Now, Talk Later, 52 True Tales of Family, Feasting, and the American Dream, is, is an interesting surprise. Vescovi is a graduate of Columbia University. His writing has appeared in places like the New York Times, Creative Nonfiction, uh, Georgetown Review, and Calliope. He's also co-author of the USS Essex and the Birth of the American Navy. So he's got some good writing background to him. Uh, and he applies it. This, this writing uh, is, is absolutely wonderful uh, in terms of uh, ease of uh, access and flow. Vescovi tells 52 different stories, primarily of Tony and De Solina, his grandparents, Antonino and De Solino, who came from a northern Italian village outside of Milan to the United States, like, like many other immigrants. And again, when you read these stories, uh, you'll think about your own grandparents and, and great-grandparents' experiences. Uh, the book is divided into La Sagra, which is kind of like you know the, the, the sacred aspect of it. It's like the origins of the family the, in Italy. Uh, Stati Uniti is the uh, section in which he tells stories of coming to the United States. Semplicità is the kind of life, the simplicity of the life that the family led. They didn't really aspire to many things or other than raising their family, making a living. Uh, si ricordiamo is a section that deals with stories that people are telling about what it was like in the old country and so on. Um, stare per finire is, you know, they're getting ready to end their lives, Antonino and Desolino, and what it's like, the troubles of uh, getting older. It's got this kind of sense of rising action, falling action, and I think really pulls it together as a memoirs. It's not just some guy telling us about his family. Vescovi puts some pictures in the back of the book uh, uh, in a section he calls scrapbook and he even throws in a couple of recipes, although I have to say that the recipes uh, uh, look a little complicated to me and, I, and I'm uh, uh, someone who loves to cook, but uh, if you follow them uh, you, you might end up eating the wonderful tortellini and brodo that his grandmother used to make. Whether you do that or not, whether you follow recipes or not, I think following the stories will be a wonderful um, way of paying attention to the past so that it matters to the present. It's James Vescovi's Eat Now, Talk Later. Coming up next, our exclusive event. Cibo è cultura, la cultura è cibo, nel senso che c'è chi dice che con la cultura non si mangia, ma di cultura ci si ciba per se stessi e per gli altri. E chiaramente questo connubio, questa connessione io la vivo quotidianamente per le migliaia e migliaia di persone che la domenica ma anche negli altri giorni vanno a vedere le mostre, la cultura, voglio dibattere di temi della cultura e soprattutto per quello che faremo nei sei mesi di Expo all'interno della città. Il Duomo di Milano ha dimensioni veramente internazionali. Fin dall'inizio è stato concepito come emblema per sorprendere i visitatori ma anche per far capire al mondo che Milano era ormai una città internazionale, 
devo dire che la costruzione della cattedrale ha rappresentato un caso molto sorprendente di globalizzazione perché venivano gli artisti dal nord Europa al sud a lavorare a Milano di solito i flussi sono dal sud al nord allora dal nord al sud perché vennero ad arricchire questo monumento gotico unico veramente Milano è basata sulle relazioni internazionali e la costruzione del Duomo ha significato fissare le linee del progresso della città. The Duomo of Milan is the highest concentration of sculptures worldwide because since the beginning of its building up in the 14th century regularly the sculptures have been changed when they get old and they are replaced by others which are similar to the ones with, uh, which are told, told away. So we have in this time on one side a museum which is the collection of seven centuries of sculptures and on the other side those new remade regular sculptures which are the quotations of the old one and the whole system together makes a history of sculpture over seven centuries. That is the marvelous situation and reality of the Duomo of Milan. Italy nasce per fare storytelling, quindi per narrare la principale bellezza italiana che è il cibo, ma ha il dovere, la responsabilità, soprattutto all'estero, di fare storytelling, quindi di narrare le altre grandi bellezze italiane, che è l'arte e la storia e i paesaggi. E quindi abbiamo deciso qua a New York di creare questo, questo room, questa sala, che parte così, parte col Duomo. Siamo l'unica penisola al mondo stretta che viaggia da nord a sud chiusa all'interno di un mare buono. E sai dov'è la risposta? È nei venti. The answer, my friend, is blowing the wind. I venti buoni dei nostri mari che fanno un incontro con le ebrezze delle nostre montagne e delle nostre colline e creano questo microclima unico. Per cui siamo il campione mondiale della biodiversità. Ti dico solo due numeri per capirlo. 1200 vitigni autoctoni noi, 220 francesi. 533 cultivar di olive noi italiani, 70 alla Spagna, 140 cultivar diverse di grano duro in Italia, 6 negli Stati Uniti. Siamo i campioni mondiali della biodiversità, questa cosa va narrata, Italy lavora per questo. Milano oltretutto è una città d'acqua e una città agricola, nel senso che pochi sanno ma è la seconda città agricola italiana, quindi il cibo è un punto di riferimento fondamentale e soprattutto vorrei dire lo è per me. Since we actually we came here a few months ago, uh, things has gone and evolved very effectively. Uh, we are very ahead of our uh, ticket sales targets. Uh, I actually had my target to sell more than 5 million tickets before opening next year. We are well ahead, we are more than 6 million tickets sold. Uh, it, it's not a commercial factor, we need to attract people because we are building an extraordinary stuff in our city. So uh, the more the number of people come in, the more we've been doing a nice thing to offer to the worldwide population. If you think about parents, they actually teach three things to their kids. The language, typically the religion, and how to eat. If you put these three things together, these are the pillars of culture. So the relationship between food and culture is actually very strong. It's what you pass over, over the generation and the decades. So uh, if you think countries coming in, they actually tell their culture through food. And this is going to be the meaning of coming over to Milan and visit our expo. Valori sono al primo punto del mio impegno amministrativo, del mio impegno politico nel senso di polis. 
chiaramente questo lo fai con più forza quanti più saranno le presenze degli stranieri e degli italiani a Expo ma soprattutto a Milano. Saranno sei mesi in cui ci sarà dibattito, confronto, convegni internazionali ma soprattutto anche felicità e gioia e quindi anche un po' di divertimento. Tutto questo è un mix che può rendere Milano veramente attrattiva e può soprattutto iniziare un percorso con tutte quelle città che hanno gli stessi obiettivi. This edition of iItaly TV was brought to you by Colavita Extra Virgin Olive Oil and Baci Perugina Chocolate. Say I love you in the Italian way. Coming up on next week's episode, Americans in Love with Italy, Francine Sagan meets actress Lois Robbins. Dolce Vita, Crave It, a contemporary Italian bakery on West 14th Street. City, annual installation of the acclaimed modernist Medardo Rosso at the Center for Italian Modern Art. Events, luxury and excellence at Mad Museum in La Fondazione, New York.